Hey, what's up? Uh, my name is Stan Chisholm, AKA 18 and Counting. I'm a uh, musician and artist based out of and dedicated to St. Louis, Missouri. I've uh, been kind of doing my thing on a, on a couple different levels from teaching to illustration, design, events, um, some call those parties, <laughs> uh, you know, art shows, music releases, some of, a little bit of everything. I've just kind of been uh, blipping through it all for a bit, and that's, that's kind of how I do it. That's how I prefer to, to explore. Um, a few influences of mine, oh, well, this is my piece, just so you know what's going on. We're here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. Uh, this is my piece, The Pursuit and Proof of Infinite Abilities, uh, commissioned last year uh, to show alongside the amazing Keith Haring, uh, quite the pleasure and, you know, quite the, the invitation to be part of all of this. I'm glad I got to do that. Um, a couple of my influences, I'll talk a little bit about Keith Haring, who's obviously one of mine, but Beyond Keith, I'd say, I don't know, like two, two of my biggest are, we'll go with Yves Tanguy. I just love his, uh, his sense of abstraction and also like characters. It's just like a lot of feeling in these things that are not specific things. And I just love that middle ground. Um, a, lot of, a lot of my work kind of resonates with that idea of representing a lot of several items and several people and several emotions at once, um, as well as like the sort of gloomy landscapes and just sort of like dreamy scapes. I don't know, I, I, I dig that. Uh, and then Jenny Holzer is a huge one of mine, uh, just the, the purity of text-based work and the, um, the no question about what's being said and what's being delivered is like super potent and important to me, um, especially as someone who identifies as a writer as well as an illustrator. I think all of those things kind of go hand in hand. Um, of course, on like the more pop side of things, like Looney Tunes cartoons always was a big thing for me um, when I was younger, which I think of course kind of leans into why I resonate with uh, Keith Haring's work. At the time that I discovered it, uh, when I was a teenager, I was just amazed at how simple the work can be and how um, universal that becomes and how easy to relate to the work it is. Um, and of course, being able to be, you know, to, to fill social comments and to be applied to um, music and, and advertisements and pop culture, there's just something about the legs that his work has and the consistency of it and just like landing the branding and just kind of that same, no question about what you're getting. Um, I don't know, I just have a lot of respect for that and I try to, try to resonate that with my work as well. Um, as a kid, I mentioned Looney Tunes, like I, I made a lot of drawings like that. That's kind of where I learned my line work and, um, you know, really just like how to connect with people. When I was young, I went to school um, out in the county, I lived in the city and, you know, just sort of soaking in and understanding that balance and the differences and the things that aren't that different that we make seem different. Just, uh, you know, just really just absorbing how people interact was, was a thing I've always been actively doing. And I felt like making art was my way to connect with people. Just like, you know, when I was in first grade, my friends told me I was too good to be in the drawing contest, so I had to judge it. And, you know, that was like a huge moment for me, like realizing it's like, oh yeah, th this is my value. This is where um, I can relate to people. Even without having to say anything, this is, something I have and having that option to be quiet or really vocal was uh, just really powerful to me. Um, this alias that I use, 18 and counting, a lot of people think it has to do with age. It has nothing to do with age at all, um, but really has more to do with me identifying um, as an artist and, well, first identifying as a person who just got along with and was intrigued with the different avenues of socializing with different people and just sort of counting the ways of who I am and who, uh, you know, how I relate to people. So I counted personalities, right? It's like, oh, well, I get along with the skater kids. I get along with the, with the sports kids, you know, the city kids, the county kids, all, you know, just, just understanding the difference of people and valuing it as something that I could embody was uh, where I began counting, right? So this number changed. It grew, it, it, it developed as I, you know, began to understand myself in relation to other people. 
And at some point I just stopped at the number 18. You know, I decided it just looked good. I decided it was kind of silly to count these, these personalities, right? But that's what we do as we, as, as we are understanding and discovering ourselves. And, you know, by the time I got to high school, you know, I started that name thing when I was like 13 or something. And when I got to high school, I realized, all right, I'm pretty serious about this art. I'm pretty serious about all these different types of art, um, from making beats to rapping to um, painting, graphic design, photography. Like, I wanted to do all those things. And I noticed that everyone you studied at that time was known for doing one thing. Like, all of these artists, they just had their style. And maybe that's just because they had that consistency, so it was easy to study them. But I just never wanted to be that. So 18 and counting became um, different aliases for making different types of art. It was like my excuse to be able to seriously um, explore all of these different mediums and know that that is just who I am. That's just what I do, you know. I studied, I mean, I've, I've just kind of always drawn. Like I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago because I didn't have to have a, a, a major. I just kind of blipped around a lot of printmaking, um, painting, woodworking, um, you know, sculpture. I just kind of did what allowed me to sort of jump and blip around, you know. And then like the Chicago street art scene taught me a lot about really just community, like getting to know people and just like kind of trusting strangers because of their taste. And you find out that they're fantastic people and you, 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 keep, you keep in touch with that. Um, and it's kind of the mystery too of it all. It was, it was kind of really, really attractive to me. So um, one thing that, you know, I'm a St. Louisan, but like we just don't have the same street art culture that Chicago did, does, um, or did at that time. So like that was also a big influence on me, like having a place to, to put up stickers and make little small things and, and share with the anonymous and, and with, you know, the masses without having to get it approved and go through all the, the, the loops and all of that. Sort of talking about like how I connect with people and how I relate to people, like collaboration has always been an important thing, especially lately with, with my music making. A lot of room for improvisation with other creative people in the moment is really sometimes more powerful than just talking and using words. And it's just like always a magical thing to have um, successful results from somebody that you just connect with in that way and in that moment and like or even to make a mistake in front of somebody you know something's offbeat or something's the wrong color or too wide or spelled wrong or whatever flaws could happen like to be that vulnerable um, with someone on that level I think is, is I don't know a, a powerful way to, to express yourself and to really be ingrained in the world and how things actually go you know it's, the stuff's not all pretty and when it happens we're impressed by it we love movies that look good, but we know that there's a lot of things that didn't make the final cut. So, um, yeah, I would say collaboration is super, super important, even if it's just like sharing space with somebody. You know, and I also teach as well, so like that ends up being a thing where I have to explain like what may seem like a simple concept to me, even just getting to dive into that teaches me a lot. And, you know, hearing someone else's opinion on how something gets made or what it reminds them of is like really like it, it shapes how you go about your week or your month or it shapes how you um, you explore your current the current themes you know I might find myself drawing differently or even just drawing more pleasant things just because I'm thinking about who I'm teaching or who I'm learning from at that moment so I don't know I would say like collaboration is like one like it's so 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 important the relation to chess is like I learned when I was younger, uh, around the same time that I decided to start collecting my drawings and I decided to like to gift someone a drawing is like a powerful thing to, to the person receiving it. And even like to, to let go of your own work, I think is a powerful thing. Around that same time, I learned chess. Um, uh, I guess it was around third or fourth grade. And you know, it kind of, it, you know, it's, I think I just, I just said yesterday uh, to someone that's, I would rather feel stupid than left out, you know, and to, to know how something works and to see someone be so incredible and so thoughtful and like, and tacti tactical <laughs> about, about a game or a process and to share that is like, it's, it's cool, you know, it's, it's nice to know that you are not the greatest or to be vulnerable to like not being the greatest but still enjoy it, you know, to enjoy the game regardless of skill level. I think with this piece was, was kind of a, a big move because I started getting into this 
sort of like gaudy style of, of abstract graphic work. Um, and I hadn't really done a lot of it. You know, I've done a couple small projects and things in my sketchbook. And when this large scale project came up and, you know, and the, the focus and the spotlight and the severity of, of the company, I decided, yeah, this is what I want to do. I'm going to make it work. Every other year, I'm doing a completely different series. Every other year, I'm working on a different type of music or learning a new style of something. And um, I don't know, it just kind of keeps it fresh for me if, if there's a place to put those things. So having that interaction like a, in a chess game, something to sort of connect and bump against, you know, some, a, a constant test of your logic and a constant test of your bravery is like really, really important to me. Um, I, you know, so with this piece, you know, I talked about, you know, I was, I was sort of collecting these graphic abstract pieces that I wanted to become more and more complex. And I really struggled with figuring out how to make that relate to chess. And as well as something that is so literal, like it's a, there's rules to the game. It's like, it's a deep history and it's kind of hard to really reinvent that. But knowing that part of the beauty of abstract work is that the, whoever's seeing it is ultimately who's gonna decide what it means to them or what it's about. Um, which is a very vulnerable place to be when you're used to like writing songs where there is a literal point to it. Or if you're doing a portrait of someone, there's a literal person that you're making. And, you know, to totally avoid all of the, the all of what chess is in terms of like the, the pieces, right? If you don't know what the pieces are, how do you play it? I don't know, I'm sure this, 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 this it's something you could test out and try, but I wanted to really get into that um, that comparison of abstract pieces, but you still know that they are chess pieces. There's kind of no question about what they are, but there is question about who they are. And I just love that middle ground. And uh, so I, I, I don't know, I, talk, I thought a lot about, is it just one piece? No, it has to be two, because when there's two, that's when there's competition. That's when you, always, that's when you have a, a comparison. It's, that's what makes the game. Right? You can practice on yourself all day, but when you have an actual component that's, or an actual opponent, that's when you're testing the skills. And then I also struggled with, all right, well, I really want to start getting into text pieces, too, that are painted, because I've done a lot of sculptural text pieces and a lot of digital like projection and, gra and digital graphic works or even print. Um, but to get into painting text pieces as well, and even the combination of text and graphics is like, it's a tough thing to figure out. So. Um, you know, I realized, you know, I thought about the other things that get to get away with just being design and decided, yeah, I am a designer, so I can do abstract work and have it just be about how good it looks. So my process is like, it's a lot, you know, it's like I'll spend some years just kind of drawing things and thinking about what they mean to me before I even share them with anyone. Like I collect drawings in my sketchbook. Um, I, Years ago, really honestly, around the time that I discovered Keith Haring's work, I knew I was really into characters, but I didn't feel like my characters were good enough. I didn't feel like they were developed enough. So I put myself on this like three year mission of just drawing what I called mascots, drawing these different like character heads on paper plates. And I just like stacked them up. And there was something nice about this never ending sort of, um, sort of project and like them not having any real order or how vague the characters become and how much they can represent in being vague or just giving you just enough to relate to it or to call it something. Um, that collection and that like creation of a, of, a, of a library or a catalog of marks made and, um, and the emotions that are explored, even if it's like something graphic like this, like it's important for me to collect those so I have something to like almost self-reference. It's like they begin to try to outdo each other as opposed to be so good that it outdoes the rest of the world. I mean, I usually, I draw a lot. Uh, whenever I'm going to make a big project of this scale, I make a lot of sketches. Just, I don't make them so I have something to throw away, but I do make them so I address all the things I'm thinking about. If it's like, okay, well, do I want to do the night? Okay, well, do I want it to be the rook? Well, I'll just draw like, little logos of those things as I'm thinking about it, it just to physically be making things um, helps prove to me that I have given it thought and it helps me um, 
think about what all of those things mean as symbols. For this project, I looked up a lot of, um, you know, just like the, the history of knight's armor, because, and the funny thing is, I went into that because I hoped to find real meaning behind like the, the gaudy, like etched artwork. And I was like, well, why would someone put so much work into something that's just gonna get wrecked in battle? And it's just like, that level of arrogance is absurd to me. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to, to, like I'm gonna wear fine, beautiful jewelry and just, and just mangle people. What does it mean to make something that is so like overflowing with just like, oh, I don't know, just like gaudy and like, and shiny, you know? I just wanted to make that and get away with it, you know? Cause I feel like a lot of people just get to get away with it. It's like, oh yeah, it's just pretty, it's just pleasant. Like how do you make something that is so devoid of immediate reason, but resonates really well and represents the time and represents the culture because it is celebrated and carried along with actual people who do actual things. I have a separate studio space that I do a lot of like the messy work, or sometimes I go there just to be in a different think space. Um, I have my, my home studio where I do small sketches or I'll put on music to just kind of like put myself in the mood or I'll just make music for myself to, to think to. Uh, so I don't know, at my studio you'll find like modular synthesizers, uh, you'll find, I don't know, I keep light tables around. That's helpful for me to recreate and trace my own work so I don't ruin the original thing. Like it's nice to be able to see, oh yeah, what would this look like if I put a stupid mustache on it? And I can do that if I like trace it and redraw it. Um, I like making copies of things for that same purpose, like cutting my drawings up and collaging them just so I can rearrange and see them in different ways. Um, all the time, I mean, I'm, I'm huge on just straightforward pencil and Sharpie. I think having the basics, um, people can relate to that. So yeah, what's, I mean, what's next? I don't know, like I, I, I really feel like I'm pretty early in on this particular style, this like, this graphic abstraction and I don't know, like I, I thought to myself, like I've been, I made like some coloring books and I've got a bunch of little small collect, like drawings that I made. I've been feeling really good about it. And uh, right before I was invited to do this project, I told myself, it's like, yeah, these are mural worthy. Um, I see so many abstract murals around every city all the time. There's something about large scale abstract work that gives, it makes it an environment it becomes that, you know, it becomes the fog in the background that we all love seeing photos of. It becomes the changing of the leaves that we all love seeing in the background. Um, sometimes you need murals that are direct and straightforward, but sometimes we also need like another place to think that isn't so direct, that doesn't remind you so much of what you've already seen or maybe what you're trying to avoid or maybe what you're sick and tired of. So I've been thinking about these works as if I can say deserving of scale. Um, I haven't like deliberately sought it out. I just kind of, I like to just wait for things to happen when, when there's nothing on the plate, when there's nothing on the, in, you know, lined up. That's when I'm doing other stuff and that's when I'm exploring like more music and that's when I'm writing and developing what's next. So when the opportunities show up, I already got something set, I already got the idea to figure out. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess I would say that that's next. Uh, I would like to get back into like text work as paintings, really just kind of this, like silver, black, kind of simplify things for myself because I do have a lot of ideas and a lot of things that I want to um, explore, but I tend to just find satisfaction and move on to the next type of project and the next type of style. So really I've just kind of got like things just lined up in the background for when it's time. Honestly, what I'm working on now is just music, um, writing lyrics and recording those and completing collaborations with people I've met on the internet and some of my best friends that are, that, you know, have been to my living room, you know, it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's fun to balance all of those things, but I think that's, uh, that's what's most important in front of me right now. Um, you can find me on anything on the internet, 18 and counting, number one, number eight, A-N-D-C-O-U-N-T-I-N-G, no spaces. Um, whatever your favorite platform, or your favorite old platform, a new one, I'm on there with that name. So uh, reach out to me. Otherwise, I'm in St. Louis. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Pete. 
E-Y-E-Z-I's Walliger. And uh, this is my chess set at the Chess Hall of Fame here in St. Louis. This summer I was invited to be a part of my very favorite artist's work. His name is Keith Herring. You can see his work on my mask. He is my very favorite artist. He has inspired me since day one. I look up to him as the godfather of street art. He was the first guy in a time in New York that there was graffiti tags everywhere that he did these inter intricate, almost aboriginal drawings in the subways in New York, and he exploded. I found, out, I found his work when I went to a summer art program in Brooklyn when I was 17 and was completely inspired to be Keith Herring, to be Keith Herring essentially, one day. Um, so as we see here to the right, this is my chess set that I designed for the Chess Hall of Fame. Um, typically, I work in stencil art, like you see here. My stencils um, are intricately designed pieces. Um, as you can see here, uh, the background is a, tr a typical style of my work, um, where I cut out intricate de detailed stencils um, that basically, like here in the queen, you can see how it lines up. And then when you have it right there, you spray paint the art, and then you can pull away in the negative shape forms the image. Same here with the king. Oh. So you can see how that lines up. I'll kind of scoot closer to the camera so you can see the detail of the stencil. So like I said, Keith Haring is a major influence in my work. Um, a lot of the colors that I use uh, are inspired from Keith. Keith. His um, use of really bright primary colors are very much an influence on my work. Um, another big influence other than Keith Haring um, is a guy by the name of Banksy. Um, I'm sure you all have seen Banksy's work. He's probably the most prolific artist today, um, but nobody knows who he is. I was fortunate enough years ago, I was on a website called stencilrevolution.com. And this was around 2001, 2002 when I first started stenciling. And believe it or not, Banksy was also on that site. Many other artists like Shepard Ferry, Logan Hicks, um, and I can name a list, were on this site. And I was able to develop a relationship with a lot of these artists. Uh, what I'm gonna show you here is actually some pieces that Banksy sent me uh, before he got huge. This is um, a Weapons of Mass Destruction featuring the Queen. And then this really cool sticker uh, that I, I put a few around, but I saved one. And if you look very close, it says, uh, Banksy down here at the bottom. Can you see that? But it's spelled out in like letters. But this is one of his stickers that he put up. Some of my other inspiration comes from my sons. Being a father has really pretty much made me uh, be inspired by my kids. One of the first public art pieces I did was a big portrait of my son Sam crying it was a baby, uh, it was an electrical box here in Central West End that is not far from the Chess Hall of Fame. It's gone now, but it was up for about 10 years. You might remember it was a big crying baby. And that was one of the first public art pieces, or I should say legal uh, public art pieces that I put up. And uh, from years on, I did many other tributes to my son, uh, like this one here. This one here is a portrait of my second son, James. It's on this giant um, building on, on South Broadway. And I used his eyes. And this last piece is a tribute to my third son, Leo. And I painted this a few years back on Cherokee Street. And the message here is, I scream for peace. As you can see here, I have brought in a few um, 
pieces and collaborations that I've done over the years. This first one right here is a collaboration with a group from New York. They go by You Are New York. And these were actually made at a fundraiser at Urban Outfitters in New York City, where we painted these live. And this was a tribute to Keith Haring. As you all may or may not know, Keith Haring died of AIDS. This event was to stop AIDS. It was a, um, where artists all painted on stop signs. So we created these for that event. Here's another piece uh, that I painted with an Australian artist by the name of Megs. Uh, years ago, I was actually in Melbourne, Australia for a show that I did uh, called Luchador Collabo Mask, where I collaborated with about 30 Australian artists. So while I was there, I actually brought this stencil with me and collaborated with Megs. You can see his name here and here. Um, but the funnier part of the craziest serendipity of it all is that about a block away from the gallery in Australia, there was a mural that was painted by Keith Haring. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, that is so cool. It was probably the first time I had seen a piece. Well, he painted this piece in 1984 when he made a trip back there. And the unfortunate part was on the building, there was a sign that said up for demolition. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? They're going to demolish the Keith Haring piece. So I had this stencil with me in Australia, and there was a fence right outside of his mural. And I said, I'm not going to let this happen. So I sprayed this portrait of Keith and then started painting out in his hand style, never forget Keith. But right before I was about to finish, the building owner came out. And he said, what are you doing painting on my fence? And I said, what are you doing tearing down a work by Keith Haring? Keith Haring, who's that? I almost lost it. I said, do you know who Andy Warhol is? And he said, uh, yeah, of course. Well, I'm like, Keith Haring and Andy Warhol are about one and the same. He's like, well, I'm calling the cops. So I hurried up, finished my piece. I took off. The next day, an Australian newspaper saw this wall. They took a photo of it and published an article, uh, which was also online. The Keith Haring Foundation, which is in New York City still today, saw that. And long story short, they purchased that building. They, re, uh, they, they had someone fix the mural up. And they said, the next time you're in New York City, we would love for you to come visit Keith Haring's studio. So I was actually allowed to come into Keith's space. I got to look through his file flats full of all of his old drawings. Up on the wall, you could see where there was residue of paint that had seeped through a canvas of Keith's work. It was probably one of the best days of my life. I almost get choked up thinking about it because uh, it was such a special experience. But Keith has been an art angel to me in my life. There's been many amazing occurrences where, you know, Keith Haring has been a part of my art. Just like here, I did a tribute to Keith Haring uh, one year. Uh, during Art Basel. And this was before Wynwood was really kind of happening. It was, I don't know, kind of looked like Vice City, Grand Theft Auto at that point, you know. Uh, but anyway, I was invited to come down. Other artists like Logan Hicks, uh, David Cho, the London Police, uh, Black Lorat, another massive stencil artist, they were all there. So that year, I actually cut off all my hair. Uh, and as you see in this video right here, it's a quick time lapse of basically me becoming my idol, Keith Haring. Sorry, I better keep enough. So my art journey began really in playing music. You know, as a kid, uh, I did a lot of drawing. I did a lot of like sculpting. As you can see here, um, I want to show you a few of my early works. Um, this piece right here was actually done uh, when I was in second grade. We had a first communion book and we had to do these illustrations. Not sure really what I was thinking here, but I think it was um, basically naked and poor at the uh, steps of a church. This next image here was done around the same time and it's uh, images of my family uh, drawn from a second grader's eyes. This third one was from a book that I created at the college school. I went to the college school here in St. Louis. 
um, and we did a, a, a stories book. So this image right here um, is from the book that we created, and they actually asked me to create the cover. Um, if you look closely, you can see an eyeball, uh, early eye work of this flying eyeball. Back in high school, I also was very much involved in music. Uh, I played guitar since probably eight, eight or nine years old, and around freshman, sophomore year, I started up a band with a few guys at Webster Groves High School called Cucumber Jones. As you see, this image right here is one of the drawings from my band logo. My art teacher actually saw this band logo and was one of the main reasons that now I am doing art. At this point, she had said, why don't you explore more of your visual art? And she sent me to a summer art program in Brooklyn, New York, where I discovered Keith's work at Pratt Institute. That whole trip changed my life. But at that time, my, more of my focus was graphic design and video, but then it evolved into what you see today. Here's a few more images from around that same time of, of my art. Like I said, my, my, my work is very much influenced by Keith Haring. Uh, like I said before, a lot of my colors come from Keith's work. So for this exhibit, when they asked me to do this, like I said, I've done a lot of tributes to Keith Haring. I kind of wanted to focus more on chess. Uh, but one of the things I did pull from Keith Haring uh, which you will see here in the exhibit is the story of red and blue. And as you notice here, uh, I chose red and blue as my colors. Um, Keith did this thing called the story of red and blue, which you actually can see over here in the gallery, um, where that's where I inspired my work. He also has a chess set that is made out of plexiglass that has the same color scheme. So that's how I really wanted to tie in to this and not necessarily do my, a typical tribute to Keith like I had done in the past. Uh, one way my art is very different from Keith's work is he created his art with no plan. Zero plan, he would just basically draw from his line and he would follow the line and create the piece. Even when he did massive murals that I've heard, he would do the same thing. He would not even create a sketch, he would just go freehand and go it. I don't do that. I work in stencils, as you see. My work is very planned out, uh, kind of like chess. You know, it, everything's a strategic play. And every, when I'm creating a piece of art, my mind goes to, how am I going to get to Z? And maybe that comes from my graphic design background of, you know, creating a design or creating something. So when I create these stencils, I have to be very careful of precisely, you know, playing my move um, and planning my move because I do multiple layers of stencils and those stencils have to line up. As you can see in this stencil here, everything is connected on a stencil. So when you think of like, um, you know, like a letter O on a stencil font, it's connected by these bridges. So when I'm creating this, I try to, it has to be connected or it'll all fall apart. Um, Again, just like chess, you have to always be connecting to your next piece. So that's, uh, that's basically kind of the gist of like how I plan my art out. I will do multiple layers of this. Um, and then originally I would hand cut everything. It took hours. And this is when I was working a nine to five job. Uh, I had time to do that. When I went full time, instead of spending 80 hours hand cutting a stencil, I thought, wow, I know a lot about this new technology of laser cutting. Well, I didn't then, but I actually purchased a used laser off of Craigslist. They're not cheap. Uh, went all the way down to Nashville to get this thing. It wasn't working. I brought it back. I learned to repair the, 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 the laser. And then uh, since then I have been producing most of my stencils digitally. This also has allowed me to help other artists. I have another company called Fine Art Laser that I cut stencils and do engravings for different artists around the country. So as you may or may not know, yes, I'm a massive Keith Haring fan. Um, my, my house at home has a ton of his work and over the years I've collected Keith Haring's work Maybe not as much as this you see in the gallery, but I have an extensive display of Keith's work in my kitchen. I call it the Keith Herring Kitchen. 
like I said, I was also very much inspired by Keith in many ways. Uh, one thing Keith completely emphasized, and what I also agree with, is art is for everybody. You know, we live in a crazy time where, yeah, you know, we can get art all the time on Instagram, on, uh, you know, galleries everywhere, you know, obviously street art. Um, and I feel like that's another commonality or what I've ins been inspired by Keith and what he really kind of started from the graffiti movement is making his art accessible to, to everyone. Um, he was very much, uh, you know, loved to work with kids. I love to work with kids. Uh, kids love his work. Kids very much love my work. Um, I, my journey and manifestation is one day I want to be Keith Haring, you know? I mean, I've always uh, wanted to have it, you know? And one thing that I really much drew from Keith Haring was the symbol. You know, you look at artists in this world who really have made it, or especially in contemporary art, uh, look at art works like by Andy Warhol. When you say Andy Warhol, you think of a Campbell's soup can. Uh, when you say Keith Haring, you think of that radiant baby. And that works well with my eye. For years, I did not do eyes. I did portraits of people, but the most prominent feature was the eyes. And maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, I bought a 1963 Econoline truck uh, to be my art car and to like move canvases. So at that point, I was still doing the portraits. And I was like, what can I paint on this vehicle? So I looked at these portraits, and I saw all these eyes. I covered the entire Econoline truck with those eyes. And from that point on, I took it down to this simple eye. And it was probably one of the best moves that I made as an artist. And I never really said, oh, I'm just going to put eyes everywhere. I was inspired to do so. But as soon as I changed to an eye, almost like an icon, what that does, especially in our modern day where we're used to like Coca-Cola logos and, and Nike swooshes, that it helps an audience kind of tie the logo to, to me or my art. And uh, so nowadays I'm known as EYEZ and uh, that kind of came about when I got on Instagram years ago. It was like, what am I gonna change my name to or what can I find that's a short handle? And EYEZ was available. So from that point on, I was pretty much known as Eyes. Just like Keith Haring had his pop shop, I have Eyes Brand. And Eyes Brand is my accessible art to people. Um, I've had a brick and mortar. I've had an online shop. Uh, the brick and mortar was kind of tricky to do. And after recently watching the new PBS documentary on Keith Haring, which you all should check out if you haven't seen it, but he talks about that he really didn't make a lot of money with his pop shop. It was more of a way of accessibility to the general public who can't afford a $10,000 painting. Um, I closed my shop down maybe two years ago. I have moved everything online to EYEZbrand.com. Um, a lot of the stuff on there, you're actually, it's all drop shipped. It's made from a company. I don't really make a lot of money off of this, uh, but it is nice. It's, it's a, a way of actually making money while I'm sleeping. In closing, I am super honored to be a part of really St. Louis's first major Keith Haring exhibit. I know he did a book signing here years ago in Clayton, right before he passed away, I think in 1990. But there's never been a major Keith Haring show. So props to the Chess Hall of Fame for making this happen. And again, I'm super honored to be a part of Keith Haring's work. Come view, view my chess set, along with Dale Chambers, Dan Chisholm, and Ido Rosenbluth. Uh, Three, four local St. Louis artists who are also involved with this. And uh, again, I appreciate the commission and uh, I look forward to seeing you all around. Peace.